Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount today. And we're going to come to a passage today in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, where Jesus talks about judging. And uh, we're going to see if we can figure out what Jesus is teaching in Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. Let's, uh, let's look at this passage together. It says here, Judge not that you be not judged. For, what, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. You know, at one time, the most well-known verse in the Bible was John 3, 16, which says, and if you know it, I want you to quote it with me, all right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that was the most well-known verse. And it's still very known, well-known today in in, around the world. But today, the most well-known verse in the Bible is Matthew 7, 1. Although most people don't really know it by that reference. I mean, you don't see people at ball games holding signs up that says Matthew 7, 1. You know, like John 3, 16, you'd see that quite often. They, they know this verse because it's been so often quoted when someone feels like they're being judged or when they think someone is being judgmental about someone or something, they throw this verse out. Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. Now, all of you, I'm sure, have heard that verse before, whether you heard it and read it directly out of the Bible or you heard somebody say that. And while being the most well-known and oft-quoted verse nowadays, it's quite often misunderstood and misinterpreted. So let's look in the passage here and uh, figure out what it means to judge not lest you be judged. So just off the offhand here at the beginning of the sermon, I want you to look at a couple of things with me. In verse three, we're just sort of jumping around here. He says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own? So just, just sort of a surface observation here is apparently noticing something about someone and desiring to address that something is not judging, okay? We, we notice things about people or situations and noticing those things is okay. Then verses four and five, he talks about how can you say to your brother, let me, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, there's a plank in your eye. Hypocrite, remove the plank from your own eye first and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So before you try and address somebody else's problem, make sure you're in a position and able to deal with it accurately and carefully. Because we can be blind to other people's, uh, well, not what I mean to say is we can be blind to our own problems. We, we, we can overlook stuff in our own lives and we'll see this, those things in other people's lives. So we wanna make sure that we're not blind to something that would keep us from effectively helping somebody else. And then verse five also, he says, first remove the plank from your own eye, then 
you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So it's okay to remove things from other people's lives, to help them with their problems. You can do it rightly without sinful judgment tainting your doing that. And then verse six, real quick. Again, we're just flying over these real quick. And then we're gonna look more closely. Jesus says, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. So I'm reading that when I'm studying, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That sounds awful judgy to me, calling someone a dog or swine. Who are you to say that about somebody, right? That's what we would hear today. Well, in this case, it's Jesus saying that there are people who fit this description. And if anyone is in a position to judge, it's Jesus, the righteous one. And not only that, but it seems like Jesus is telling his disciples, his followers, and remember that this Sermon on the Mount was written to his, not written, but, but given to his disciples, those who were with him, following him around. And Jesus assumes that they will be able to recognize and discern and distinguish between those to whom it would be a waste of time and resources to give what is holy and valuable and those to whom it would not. So it seems that in some cases, judgment is warranted. But again, what kind of judgment? Um, what do we do with this passage? What is Jesus trying to teach his disciples about judging? Is he contradicting himself? Is this passage just too hard to understand? Is this something that was meant for them in that day, in that culture, or is this something that Jesus' followers can practice at all times and all places with all people? Well, I think it is, just like the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is something that we can learn from and put into practice today. So as we go back and we look at verse one, where he says, judge not that you be not judge. The word judge here means to judge in a judicial sense. In the, con the context of this passage, verses one through six, connotes a condemning and avenging judgment that goes beyond mere discernment and is more retributional at heart. It's a judging that makes rash, unjust, unloving judgments from a spirit of self-righteousness. This is the kind of judging Jesus is condemning. The kind of judging that is forbidden here by Jesus is the kind of judgment that is reserved only for God. That which is ultimate and eternal, it's complete, it's full and thorough. God is omniscient. He knows the hearts and minds and motives of every single person. Only God can judge in that ultimate, eternal, complete sense. We don't know a person's heart. We don't know their motivation. We're not God and we should not play God. I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. We are not God and we must not presume to be someone's ultimate judge. That's God's place. We need to remember that we are saved by grace through faith not because we're good enough, not because we deserve it, not because we can earn it, because we can't. It's simply the grace of God that explains why anyone at all is saved. So let's not forget that. If we do forget that we were saved by grace, then we're going to become judgy and judgmental and use unrighteous judgment out of a spirit of legalism rather than guided by the spirit of grace. And you know, if you really think about it, you know it is impossible to not judge and draw conclusions. You know, I'm not talking about 
what we were just saying is only God's, only reserved for God. I'm just talking about every day we make judgments on our own, in our lives. Um, living a life of non-judgment is impossible because we judge things every day like, I think I should get out of bed. <laughs> I should go to work. I should take a shower. I should get dressed. I mean, right? Every day we make decisions like, this is the right thing for me to do. This is good for me to do. I should eat something. I should be honest and truthful. I should go to the store. I should use my brakes right now, or I'm gonna hit that car, or I'm gonna run that red light. So we make judgments and decisions all day long and that is good and right and okay, expected for us to do those things. Because when we even think about the Sermon on the Mount, everything we've learned in chapter five and chapter six up to this point, we have to decide on things that Jesus talked about, like what to, we need to determine what is righteous, what is the right thing to do, what is pure, how, can, how do we be pure in heart? How do we know what that is? We have to have an idea of what it means to be salt and light in the world. We have to agree with God that murder is wrong. We shouldn't do that. And that reconciliation is right. That adultery is wrong. And hell is real. That we love our neighbors and our enemies by doing good to them. Well, what is good? We use our judgment every day to try and understand and put into practice what we think that is. So how else do we know what is good without using judgment? So the Bible encourages believers to analyze and evaluate people and actions and things in a good and right way. So Matthew 7, 1 does not forbid all judging without exception. When you take Matthew 7, 1 through 6, and look at it in the context of other scriptures, you can understand more clearly what Jesus is teaching. So let me mention some of those scriptures with you. And you, if you take notes, you might just wanna jot down the reference. You can try to follow if you're fast in your Bible. But here, here's the first one. John, the Gospel of John, chapter seven, verse 24. Listen to what Jesus said. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Wow, it almost sounds like a contradiction here between judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Well, if you're judging righteously, that's a good thing. But if you're judging self-righteously, like you're the standard, and if people don't measure up to you, you know, you can uh, judge them with some eternal edict of condemnation or whatever. That's the kind Jesus is saying, don't do that. First John four, verse one. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Well, how do you do that without judging? You have to know what you're looking for. You have to be able to discern because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So another passage that talks about this is 1 Corinthians 5. And this is where Paul has written to the Corinthians and said, you people have a problem because you have someone in your church, a man who is living and sleeping with <coughs> his stepmother. And you're asking me what you should do about this? You know what you should do about it. You should put this so-called brother out of the church until he repents. And um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13, he says, I wrote you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Now listen to this. 
He says, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. You see, Paul is separating it out. He's saying, you people in the church, that's your domain. The Spirit has given you uh, the ability to determine matters between yourselves. And we'll see that again in just a minute. But the outside, that's God's domain. I mean, His domain's everywhere, but in particular, we're not, that we're, that's not our job to judge those people. He says, For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Those who are outside, God judges, therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. He's saying on the inside of the church. You, you handle that in the church. You're able to do that. You should know what to do. And then in the very next chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul gets upset with them because there's brothers and sisters in Christ suing each other, taking each other to court. And Paul's like, why are you doing this? This is not a good testimony to others that you need to take each other to court. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8, he says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. He's saying you need to handle that in the church. Take care of it. Do you not know, listen to this, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Wow, that's what it says. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? That's what the Bible says. How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? And Paul's saying it, it'd be better for you to just accept the wrongdoing from someone else in the church rather than to take it to outside the church for them to decide. Why not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your brethren. So... Why am I bringing these things up? Because there is a sense, there is a place, there is a way in which we are to be in judgment, but not in the final condemning judicial sense that only God can do. So according to the Bible, there are some kinds of judging that's legitimate. But what is Jesus teaching us here in Matthew 7.1? I think the teaching of the Mishnah, you've probably heard that word, but you probably don't know what that is. The Mishnah is a commentary on the law in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, as we would call it, the Pentateuch. The Mishnah is a commentary on that. And listen to what the Mishnah says about judging. Do not assume the place of God by deciding you have the right to stand in judgment overall. Do not do it. I say, in order to avoid being called to account by the God whose place you usurp. That's the judging we are called to avoid. That is God's place. It is only God who can judge righteously, fully, completely, ultimately. In that sense. In fact, verse 2 tells us 
that God will judge us with the same type of judgment with which we judge others. So if you want people to be short-sighted and rash and quick to judge you without really understanding everything involved and you want God to do that to you, then you do that to other, other people. I don't know anyone who really wants that. Maybe there are. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur says this. He says, when we assume the role of final omniscient judge, we imply that we are qualified to judge, that we know and understand all the facts, all the circumstances, and all the motives involved. Therefore, when we assert our right to judge, we will be judged by the standard of knowledge and wisdom we claim is ours. If we set ourselves up as judge over others, we cannot plead ignorance of the law in reference to ourselves when God judges us. And then Jesus gives an illustration, verses three through five. The, the speck in your brother's eye and the log, the plank in your own eye. And these verses here teach us we better not be blind to our own shortcomings. Sometimes our sins or problems are more serious than the ones we see in other people. And once we've dealt with our own sins, then we're in a position to gently and lovingly help those who need it. So basically Jesus is saying in verses three, four, and five, stop looking at and pointing out other people's faults without dealing with their own first. Why do you do that? So you can feel justified that you're better than them so that you can think you look better than them in the eyes of men, so that everyone's attention will be on the other person rather than on you and the problems you have. Maybe they will ignore your faults and focus on the other guy. So Jesus says, stop doing that. But what he's not saying is don't help the other guy. We're supposed to help the other guy. He's saying that you need to make sure you're in a position where you can carefully and accurately help him. So how do we do this? How do we deal with the log in our own eye so that we are then in a position where we can help the other fellow get the speck out of his eye? Well, first of all, we confess our own sin. And often what that is, is the sin of self-righteousness, the sin of a condemning spirit toward others. And we ask God to cleanse us and forgive us of that. When our own sin is cleansed, when the log is taken out of our own eye, then we will see our brother's sin clearly and be able to help him. Then we will see everything Clearly, we'll see God clearly, other people clearly, and ourselves clearly. And we will see that God, God as the only judge, others as needy sinners, just like us, and our brother as a brother on our own level with our own frailties and needs. So we are allowed, we are encouraged and instructed to judge with righteous judgment, but not in a condemning, eternal, ultimate sense that only God can do with righteousness and justice. Our judging must be gracious and humble and helpful. Isn't that the way you wanna be judged? So with that in mind, let me ask you a question as I bring the sermon to a close this morning. As we think about judgment, the Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, that God commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by the man he has ordained, and he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So that man through whom God will judge the world, that's Jesus. So if God judged you by the standard of his Ten Commandments, do you think you would be innocent or guilty? You just think about that. If you, depending on your answer to that, I'll put it that way. Do you think you would go to heaven or hell? And if you're thinking, oh, I broke God's commandments, or at least one of them, I don't think that's going to work out well for me. Uh, if I got justice from God, I would go to hell. Does that concern you? Because it does me. What can you do to avoid going to hell? How can you go to heaven? How can you be made right in the eyes of God? Well, the Bible puts it this way. Trust in Jesus and what he has already done for you. What did he do for you? He lived a perfect life. He completely obeyed God and fulfilled his righteous requirements. He was crucified for the sins of people like you and me. And he paid the penalty and the wages for our sin, which the Bible calls death. He took the punishment for us. He was buried and on the third day he arose from the dead. And the Bible says that if you trust in him, if you have faith in and rely upon him as your Lord and Savior, that he will forgive your sins and grant you everlasting life. So listen, today we've been talking about judging, what Jesus meant by it, what he did not mean. We are not here as Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are not here to condemn people. Not at all. The Bible says people are already condemned because of their sin. We don't need to pile on. What we are here to do is to tell people about Jesus who died for them, who rose from the dead, who will come to live within them by faith through his spirit. Because as Romans 8 verse 1 promises, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is good news. Amen. So question for you this morning as we wrap up. Are you in Christ? Is he in you? If you would like to talk more about this and explore this further, I welcome you to come and see me after church or reach out to me using any of these contact ways that are on your bulletin. Uh, but if you want to avoid the ultimate judgment of God, which will be righteous and just. If you want the mercy of God, then you need to call out to Jesus who will save everyone who comes to him in faith. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege of learning from your word lord this this passage is often misunderstood and and thrown around like you're judging me stop doing that and it's often misused but lord we want to make sure we do understand what it says and it's not our job to take your place we are not god we are not ultimate judge and jury can we don't condemn we're here to help people who are already condemned in their sins to be forgiven of those sins and to live a life of grace and righteousness. So Lord, thank you for this passage. Help us to be aware of any blind spots in our own lives where we have logs and planks in our own eyes and not presume and assume that we can help others until we're ready that you've worked in us in such a way that we can be in a position to help other people.
So thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his teachings here in the Sermon on the Mount. And help us, Lord, as we continue to study this passage, to learn a lot more so that we can live a lot better for you. And we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.